$1 million a year. That is a huge milestone for any business owner. And I know from experience that getting into that seven figure club is not an easy thing to do. Well, the other day I got a text message from my friend Evelyn telling me that she'd done it. She's now a seven figure Amazon seller. Straight away, I knew I had to get her back onto the channel so that she could tell us all about her pathway from leaving behind a corporate career to becoming an entrepreneur and now hitting seven figures a year selling on Amazon. We talk about her unexpected secrets of success in hitting this impressive milestone, her business and her brand, what it looks like now on Amazon versus where it started, the pros and the hidden cons of choosing entrepreneurship over a stable career and much, much more. So please enjoy my conversation with Evelyn. Evelyn, welcome back to the channel. It's so good to have you here. Hi, Miles. It's good to be back. <laughs> so we were just talking off air about your previous life. So now you're coming onto this channel today where you are right now, you're a successful Amazon seller and I want to dig into that journey. But a couple of things were standing out in this, this conversation we were having beforehand. And, and the theme that you just mentioned was this idea of being a high achiever. And, and I think in your words, it was sort of doing things based on others' expectations. And so this was in the context of your previous career before you became an Amazon seller. So can we talk about that really briefly? Before you were an Amazon seller, what was that pathway look like? like what did that pathway look like? <laughs> you were a lawyer and then you now you're not a lawyer. Why did you go into that? And what led you to falling out of that pathway or changing pathway, let's say? I think if I look back on the journey of my life, really, I've always had this want to be at the top or you know or what society think is the top uh like so if I, for a high school i went to like the nerdiest girl school in the state and it's competitive you know a third of the grade will get a university initial index which is in the top one percent in the state so i've always had this skewed perception of what it is to do well, you know, like straight out of high school, I was working at one of the law, um, big four county firms. And when I got in, I was so excited, you know, because it's like, it just felt like, oh, this is, this is special and prestigious. And, and I ended up doing law at uni as well. And then as a graduate, you know, I got in to one of the top law firms and when I got into that, I was so excited, you know, I was like jumping up and down and like my little sister made me this little poster that was like, yay, like, but the funny thing about the jobs that I had and those things that I wanted to achieve, I was most excited about them before I ever started, you know, like getting the job was more exciting than actually being there, you know, like being there, you know, I'd have moments where oh, I was like in midnight. And I'm at my desk and I'm like, what am I doing? Like, and it's funny because when we were in uni, our legal ethics teacher told us, I would tell you that working at a big law firm is horrible. And none of you will believe me. And you will all work hard to get there. And one day you will get there. You will realize it is horrible. And then you will look back and think she was right. And yeah, and that's what it was like. So yeah, so that was a very, I, yeah, I think my background was like always like try to reach shiny things, but then they're not shiny, you from which you get that. So you had this prophet <laughs> university who told you exactly as it would be, because that, that is more or less what happened. Is it not? So you, you went into that pathway, you became a lawyer. What was there? Was there a particular moment when you realized that that wasn't the pathway that this, <laughs> this lady had been, he had been right all along and that you needed to make a change? Well, it's like when I get asked the question, where do you see yourself in five years time? My gut reaction is, I don't want to be here. Like, yeah. So I ended up changing out of law and I, I did different things for a while. I ended up in policy work, which I quite enjoy. But still, when I get asked that question, where do you want to be in five years time? I always think I don't want to be here. And that's what pushed me into you know, needing, wanting to escape really. Like, yeah, uh, just find something different to do so we'll talk about later on i think we'll talk about where you want to be in five years or whatever period that we can actually that we can actually imagine i know i hate that question too um let's jump ahead briefly to today and then we'll jump back a little bit so today you're now not working in policy work you're not a lawyer anymore you're now an amazon seller and you shared with me a few days ago i think it was you recently hit a milestone would you tell everyone what that milestone is yeah so just in the last week i've hit the seven biggest seller milestone so 
over a million in revenue in 12 months, which is, yeah, that's, I thought that was a pretty significant achievement. That's that cool. is a very significant achievement, Evelyn. Don't downplay it. That's something, I mean, that's effectively an elite club that you've just entered. And obviously people are going to be asking, all right, seven figures, that means $1 million in revenue and top line. Anyone who knows anything about business understands that revenue slash top line is kind of meaningless. So can we uh, give a little bit of context to that? So you making profit at the end of the day and what do those margins look like? Yeah, so generally, I haven't done all the books yet, but about 25% is what I guess my margin. So that's healthy. And and some people, if they're not that ex familiar with sort of e-commerce and I don't know, the, not even new wave of businesses, but let's say digital businesses, that the margins can actually be very healthy. Um, because in the traditional brick and mortar sort of world or, or in big companies, you're looking at margins of like five to 10% maybe in, in, in many cases. And so 25% is, uh, I don't know whether that's above average or round average, but it's definitely a healthy margin. So not only is at an amazing milestone in terms of the revenue that you've achieved, this big round number, but also uh, a great result at the end of the day as well. So that's awesome. So that's where you are today. <laughs> This is where we talked about where you were, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago. Let's fill in the gaps. So you said you were seeking this this feeling of looking forward to the future more. And that's what led you to start your Amazon business. Can you walk through that process in more detail? So, okay, so you're working this job and you, again, that, that feeling of the future, um, I don't know whether you call it anxiety or whatever, you just didn't like that, the response that you were, that you were giving. So how, how did you start an Amazon business? What, how long did it take? Just just walk us through that a bit, like finding the product, that whole first, the, the process of going from being a beginner, not knowing much about Amazon, to let's say selling your first product. So I think a huge influence on me starting this journey was obviously seeing your journey, you know, and you were doing so well. And I made me think, like, if the job, for me, a job is about making an income. And I just don't think it's the best way to make an income, you know? you've got this alternative that has so much potential. So I started, like I decided definitely. Can you, can we just double, double click on that? Why, what is the distinction that you see between a salaried or job-based income and starting a business like an Amazon business? Could you explain that a little bit? Well, it just this volume of the money that you end up with, because when you have a job, you're limited by you, you know, you're selling yourself. So your salary is going to be limited by the structure that you're in, you know, like what salary do they pay? Do you want to be in the position that's higher? You can't make that position and your salary is capped at a particular amount. But with an entrepreneurial approach, it feels like your income is potentially unlimited. You know, you can just keep launching new product and every new product will bring you more income. So it's not cap in a way that I think a salary would be. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I wanted to see whether our definitions would agree. I'd pretty much agree with that. Uh, I'd, I'd be pinpointing on the your ability to build something that then gives you leverage over your time. So when you're working a salary job, it's, it, as you said, it's very much, I mean, you can earn a lot per hour, but ultimately you're always working one hour and getting paid one hour's worth of time. And so the leverage is just one-to-one. -one. Whereas with ideally any business, you can put this structure in place where again, now you can just launch products and, and it's sort of like the work is done at the start, but the the return, the profit that you make is not really capped to that work. Uh, so yeah, it's about scalability and leverage. Okay, let's continue. So we're talking about time frame. So you were getting into Amazon. Tell me about that. So I decided that I was going to do Amazon, like, you know, a proper definitive decision in November 2019. And then, so I gave myself a month to learn how to do it. So I spent that month. You're working at this time? Yeah, I was still working at that time, but it was around, it was because it was November. It was like Christmas time when I was like, I'm going to spend this focused time learning how to do it. And I also was doing project product research during that time. So by January, I already had, I'd already found the product that I wanted to launch as my first product. And I got my sample uh, around the end of January. And I ended up starting to sell in the middle of April that year. But that's 2020. That's when COVID started. So that that delayed everything. So I would say it doesn't actually take that long once you decide to take that pathway to launch a product. 
Okay, so that was, did you say October, November? No, April. So I, I was studying during December, then found my first product in January, and it hit the shelves by April. Cool. Four to six months. Okay. And, and so you're working full time, so you were juggling the, you know, your existing commitments and, and then this new thing, the side hustle. This is a, I mean, this is something that I had to deal with when I was originally starting as well. I chose the alternate pathway. So I had done some other things while I was working, but not related to Amazon. Then I actually quit my job and just went all in. Not all in in terms of time or money actually, but just in terms of commitment to the cause, which was like, all right, I was gonna, I, I was done with working a job and, and effectively considering myself unemployable for the future. I wonder if you have any thoughts on whether that was ideal for you. Would you do it again the same way? Would you keep the job until you started selling? And we'll talk about where you got to when you before you finally quit your job and how that transition was like. But just for someone who is maybe now they're where you were and so they're working a job and they're like, shit, like, do I keep doing this? Do I juggle both of these things, my other commitments in life or... or do I go with the more extreme miles pathway and be fully committed to the cause? Like, would you do it the same way again? Or how'd you feel about that? I definitely transition. Like it sounds scary. Just like stopping. Like it feels risky and scary. Like, like why did you take that sudden jump? Because yeah, to me, it's hard to be too scary. I, I agree. The fear, the risk, the, that, that thought of going all in is very intimidating. Um, for me, it was liberating, but for most people, it's not so much. Okay, so April, you launched your first product, April 2020. How did you find that first product, first of all? I've been doing a lot of research on Hing Wing Tan. Yeah, so basically trying to find products that had low competition, decent keyword search. Yeah, like I, I, I rely completely on using that product while I was doing my product research. And, and for context, I'm, you know, I'm not selling a course or anything at the end of this interview. I have no sort of material monetary interest in, in the Amazon space anymore or very, very little. Uh, so I'm actually asking these questions because I'm curious about how things have been for you, but they're also how things are today. And I, I wonder, are you still finding, there's a jumping ahead a little bit, but has that product research process for you changed significantly? I don't do product research anymore because, so when I started it, I was just trying to find different products and it's a hodgepodge, you know, I've got like things in all different niches, but I think once you find an area that works, it makes no sense to branch out from that and try and build a stronger brand because having a stronger brand, I think it reduces your risk because it's easier to sell things when you have, you know, what looks like a good brand and it yeah it's an advantage to sell that way i agree with that approach um i know in, in the amazon space people don't generally talk about their brands but i've already sold mine so i don't care so for anyone who wants to look at what that looks like just as an example my brand was elixir glassware and and so having that just this little space on in you know in the amazon website that actually looks like yours in a way branding wise i mean uh, i think that is very valuable as well can i ask as well did the first product uh, did that hit? So obviously it hit enough for you to continue and see success, but is it, uh, what's that product like today, for example? Is it still selling? Is it a core part of the portfolio? What does that look like? I do think I was lucky that my first product, I would say, yeah, it was a hit. Like it did well straight away. So my first month was 7K, second month was 10K. And for a first product, I think that's, you know, that was really good because it brought in this chunk of income straight away and it gave him confidence you know like maybe too much confidence but just knowing that it worked and so now that put up the niche is more saturated i would say it's about a third of the size that it might have been at in the peak so it's i think bringing in like 3k a month now in revenue or profit so maybe so margins are smaller and sales have reduced, maybe half. Yeah. So it, it has shrunk over time. And we found that, I think that that is part of the natural product life cycle of, of particularly private labeling, where there isn't, there is a brand, but it isn't a brand in the way that it's traditionally understood. Um, and because that 
traditional brand value is actually quite low. It's much more the Amazon game, and and that's there's just this, this like uh, sort of inherent product churn. So that makes sense. Um, I think that's in line with what what we would see with like the product last three years or something, and it's still making money at the end of the day, but it just sort of reduces in significance over time. Um, cool. So with so you have one brand now or multiple brands? How did the, what was that expansion process look? What did that look like? I still only have one brand. I wouldn't say that was a strategic thing. It just laziness really. I would just launch everything up into that. And then now I've just focused on one particular area. But all, all my product. You said laziness, but efficiency is laziness directed towards a specific outcome. So I would say that was an efficient way of doing things. But I didn't even consider launching another brand. It's just I'd have to file another trademark and stuff. And so, yeah. So in the video I did with uh, with Michael, you know, you, you've met Michael, my my the manager of my business. Uh, we talk about this a lot. And that is putting a different spin on what you've just said. You've said it from one perspective, but the the business owner's conscious mindset perspective on that would be to recognize that you want to be lazy in all the things that don't matter that much. And you want to be very hard working in the one or two things that really matter. And so you have made that maybe subconscious decision, but it's the same way of thinking about it. How is the revenue split? I'm trying to get an, a picture of your product portfolio right now. Do you have a few big winners or is it really evenly distributed? Like what does that ratio look like? So I looked at my revenue split last month. Um, so there's 52 products. Each, wow. each percent of the revenue comes from each of the products. So I have lots of tiny, you know, products that make two or eight or less. And then, yeah, half of the revenue is coming just from eight and the product. Are, are most of those very simple variations, like color variations, or are those independently you've launched 52 different products? I mean, materially different products. I have a lot of variation. Yeah, like it would be like if you had, if you were selling t shirts and you have 40 different t-shirts you know like it's yeah colors and designs but not yeah it's not a complex difference between my prop okay was that part of a conscious process or again this this was just this step by step like oh i'll you know i'll try launching this and then this and then you ended up with this portfolio of you know different products but very similar variations between them i think it makes sense because when you launch things in the same niche you have the advantage of when you launch something new you should link it onto one of your other products and that has reviews already amazon advertises your own product against your your product so you you sort of saturate your niche and i think it it reduces your risk a lot like if i have a product and i have to launch it as a seller with no brand it might be a done and i might just lose a chunk of money but if you already have the brand you can just lump it onto one of your other listings and even if it's a dud you push stuff up slowly so it just felt like it reduced the risk to launch a lot of similar product with the same nudge that's the exact same approach that we took for all the way from the start to the end um and so let's let's do a bit of an overview of your amazon journey and lessons you've learned so far it's gonna be a bit more open-ended what do you think are the biggest highlights and wins have been so far in the three years that you've been selling I think you have, I feel like I have more control over my life, you know, because I'm not selling my time for money. I do feel like you can be as big as you want to be, you know, from a revenue perspective, you can make as much money as you want to make, as long as you put in the work and also are willing to take that risk. And with the whole journey, I feel like it changes how you see the world, you know, like you see possibilities more easily because you feel like oh if you want to do something just believe you can do it and do it and I don't know I just it's very freeing you know to realize that you can do whatever you want also that you don't have to meet other people's expectations because if you think about it that's not a great way to decide how to live your whole life you know trying to meet other people's expectations like you get used to thinking oh I can be different and even being I think I feel like entrepreneurs actually are a bit, you know, like they're okay with being a you know, <laughs> but like it's free, it's so free knowing that you can do whatever you want to do and achieve it. There's a, there's quite a few different sort of deep topics that you just touched on, but 
I mean, on, on a broad level, I, I definitely agree with that. It, it does change your mindset and how you perceive the world. And it does give you more of a sense of, from my personal perspective, my experience doing this as well, it really makes you feel like you have more control over things, as, as you said. And that feeling is very motivating. It's very empowering. And it's one of the main reasons why I'm doing this interview right now. Like, again, like I have nothing at the end of this that I'm going to direct people to. I just genuinely like to see when other people can follow a similar pathway, their own pathway, I mean. And at the end, you realize like, wow, there's this whole other way of doing things. Uh, another thing that I wanted to touch on, so I asked like highlights and we already shared sort of your, your milestone, which was the seven figure mark, which is an amazing milestone. But then now that I've asked you about highlights, you know, you didn't say, oh, I, I'm a seven figure seller now. You talked about this like deep feeling, this deep, you know, the mindset shift and then also how that's changed how you're approaching your life, how you're living your life or seeing the world. Do you think that there's some, um, let's say like dissonance between this idea of the achievement? Because, you know, to people watching this, everyone wants to hear that you're the seven figure seller. That's a milestone. That's something that can be compressed into, you know, really simple. Hey, oh, she sold a million dollars. Wow, that's amazing. And obviously made profit as well. But to speak about the deep, fundamental changes inside you, the internal journey, like it, it doesn't sell as much. So I wonder like, have you ever encountered this sense of dissonance between this like this milestone, this once off thing that's like, oh wow, well money, money came in today and uh, you know, I, I just hit a new record this month, whatever else versus that internal journey, which is a much more slower, at least the impression I get is a much more slow process that there isn't one thing where you can really point to. It's a bit of an open-ended question. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because actually when I reached that seven-figure milestone, I realized that I'm excited about it for only like 10 seconds. You know, it's just like, yeah, that's a really big amount. Like, can't I, like, I can't believe I sold like all this random stuff, at like a million bucks worth of it. But I've actually come to realize I've become completely immune to the numbers now. You know, you could tell me I made another, a whole another million in a year and I don't, it doesn't bring me any more joy. Like, if, like I've heard actually, if you earn more than 70,000 a year, your marginal happiness doesn't get much higher. And yeah, I have reached that point where the numbers, they don't really matter to me anymore. So I've realized that it's more about the journey, you know, like, I don't think that when you reach a particular destination, suddenly everything's magically happy. You've got to appreciate the journey as you get there. It's very true what you're saying. And I think it's funny too, because I think we have similar, um, is it a type A personality where you're very goal focused, naturally speaking. I struggle to appreciate the journey. And I feel like I actually had to spend a lot of time suffering to chase a goal, to learn this lesson that some people already know just inherently it's their way of being, their way of thinking which is the journey is there to be appreciated. And the journey is all there is. Sorry, the, the journey is everything. <laughs> and it's all you have, like that's your experience. But yeah, I feel like it's, it's, it took a lot of suffering um, for me to realize that or to start realizing it. It's something that I have to learn every day. Do you, have you, has that been challenging for you as well? Or has it, have you sort of, you know, just grown naturally into that, that understanding that the journey is the way? I mean, I do think just in general, it's really important to try and be a joyful person, you know, because no matter where you go, who you meet or what you achieve, the constant you are always going to have with you is yourself. So if you're someone who, you know, appreciates the little things, laughs easily, values the people around you, then I think it's a lot easier for you just to be content in general. What was your biggest challenge so far? I asked you about the biggest highlight or the biggest win, let's say, what have you struggled with on this journey? This Amazon journey? I think to anything there's pros and cons and actually you know the challenges of having this freedom and being able to make any amount what is how do you motivate yourself you know like everything is on you you don't have someone telling you what projects you're working on today or how much work you're going to do that yeah that's a challenge that lack of structure and how do you motivate yourself also I think entrepreneurial pathway there's a lot of uncertainty you know like you take for granted when you have a normal job you get this regular paycheck but now it's like 
your revenue is all lumpy and anything can, things happen all the time. You know, your shipping can be delayed by months. People, Amazon loses your inventory and this uncertainty is something that you have to adjust to. And I, I don't think I even have adjusted until yet. And I think that's a really big difference compared to having a normal job and a challenge. And so let's go deeper into both of those. So more or less, you said, firstly, motivation and, and finding that motivation kind of intrinsically, I suppose, because you're not, it's almost like the, the flip side of having, when you have less freedom, you don't have to think about all the other things you could be doing. And so therefore, you know, there's not many other things you can do. So you just do the thing that's in front of you and, and that's both good and bad. But then when you are free, <laughs> because you have created this freedom for yourself through a business and through a sort of, you know, the, the leverage that we talked about, then suddenly there's all these other things you could be doing with your time. And so why should you continue grinding or working or, you know, focusing on that goal instead of just doing whatever it is that takes your fancy with Amazon, I'll go back a bit, you know, so I used to have, I was selling on Amazon for what, five years. I struggled with this a lot going through, I think you mentioned, you know, like the milestone, like it comes and it goes. I not only had it come and go, but I actually would find a really big dip, like a negative dip after the big milestone. If it was up this much, then the next day or even that day. And for a period afterwards, I would be down by an equal amount because then I'd be like, well, what's next? You know, I just achieved this milestone and suddenly it's come and gone. <laughs> like, how do I, how do I pick up the, where do I find this source of energy to like do it again? If, if it just, I go straight back down again. Um, I don't have the answer with that. I found, and I got a lot of motivation from having a team and just realizing that although I wasn't that money motivated, I mean, like that's a blessed privileged position to be in, which is to have a feeling of, of financial abundance, whether you have it or not, the feeling that you do is what really matters, honestly. And so I realized that I could have that abundance and I could help in a way in which people were helping me and employ, you know, pay Michael a lot of money and pay the rest of my team, a small team, but it was still like people that I had a close relationship with. And I think ultimately it's all going to come down to your motivations will come down to like human connection in one way, shape or form, whether it's love or whether it's just friendships, professional relationships. That was what it was for my Amazon business. And then also just finding more motivations in, in other areas of my life. I don't know if you have anything, does that trigger anything for you or anything else you wanted to talk about in terms of the motivation piece? I think motivation is an area where I struggle. You know, I really, I, I don't even know if I feel motivated to get any bigger than I am now or, yeah. So it's one of those areas where I, I, I still haven't figured it out. Yeah, the general market. The relevance here is maybe a lot of the people who are going to watch this are they're not at the stage where they're, they're like, oh, geez, I want the money. Like that's motivating. So that's fair enough. Like that's uh, that's understandable in that position. But I want to dwell on this a little bit because that's where I am, and that's clearly where you are as well. Which is that once the money motivation pays off and you do the work because you're so you know you're desiring that like the, the carrot that's in front of you. I think most people will reach this stage. And so I just want to raise it a bit now. Again, you, you might not think that this is particularly relevant to you, but trust me, it, it will become relevant one day. And it's clearly, we, we don't have the answers. We don't have these things figured out, but just know you will, you'll have some ups and downs. Uh, and, and one day, hopefully the goal is to not always be so motivated by money. The goal is to reach, to reach this next mountain. You, you, you send one mountain and then there's another one in the horizon and you reach that one. And that's where you can actually, you know, be motivated, be motivated, pardon me, by, by other things. I think the challenge is that I think humans feel losses more than gain. So it'll be like, oh, you get a gain and you're like, oh yeah, that's nice. And then even if that level fall, you're like, oh no, I fell. You're like, even though you're still at a good level, <laughs> when it be all, you know, like for instance, for Prime Day, I just had my best day ever on 11 July. So it was 26.9 cane sales in one day. And that is a big figure. That's huge. But the whole day, I just felt anxious because I was like, oh, I didn't expect this. I thought Prime Day would be twice as big as a normal day and it's seven times as big. Now I'm running out of stock. And I just thought about all the lost potential revenue <laughs> because of the fact I was running out of stock. So even though it was a great achievement, I just felt anxious because I was thinking about the lost potential profit. Like, and yeah, even though I knew I was doing that, it was hard not to do. Yeah. 
I mean, Buddhism and spirituality and, and philosophy have answers for this, but it, it, the solution is more or less emotional non-attachment. Um, the, the bias that you described, which is, was it loss aversion bias, whatever the, whatever the name is, basically it's, it's exactly what you said. It's that uh, between an equal win or an equal gain and an equal loss, the loss will hurt you more than the gain feels good. And so the consequence of that psychological bias, which is the way that we're all programmed, it means that the more tied you are to these things, again, to watching these numbers and seeing them go up, which again is the original motivation why most of us get into this is because we want that number to go up. <laughs> but, and this ties into the second point, which was uncertainty and volatility in, in, a, in a career path or a life pathway like this to live like this, that the more tied we are to that uncertain sort of not outcome necessarily, but the day-to-day -day fluctuations, as you said, like a huge result in one day, and yet you're just anxious the whole time. It's because ultimately we're tied to it. And this is not the, the platform for like a spiritual sort of talk, but uh, that's something that I've learned a lot in a non-spiritual way, just while I was selling on Amazon and just learning that over and over again, because every Christmas and every, every prime day, every, every Black Friday, and then just before Christmas, the same shit would happen. The numbers would get bigger and bigger and I would get stressed <laughs> like, or more just stressed and like, like, wow, damn it. Like what if it goes wrong or <laughs> just that anxiety feeling? I don't think there's anything you can do other than disconnect from that. Disassociate both in the day to day, the moment to moment, as in like, if you have, if there's nothing you can control, maybe there is, but most likely there isn't. If you're looking at short, short time frames, honestly, just like stop looking at it. Let's move on into the second piece. Cause that was the great segue. You asked before, or, or you talked about the challenge of dealing with uncertainty and dealing with volatility, let's say in your income, but it's really the uncertainty of like, what comes next? You know, is today going to be a good day or a bad day? <laughs> and always being attached to that and being worried about it. Tell me your thoughts just in general, first of all, like, I, was this something that you thought about before you became an entrepreneur and started selling on Amazon? Or is that just something that you've learned and realized is an issue as you've come through this journey? I wouldn't have thought about it before I started because you just, I wouldn't have experienced it before because I would have had a regular paycheck before, but it's only when it's gone, you realize, oh, like I don't have regular, well, I, I still have regular money coming in now, but it's just the notion that things could change in any moment, you know, like, not that I think my account would get shut or anything like that, but those sort of stories exist or say your inventory, like what if you can't sell it? You're stuck with it. There's just a lot more uncertainty relative to what I was used to having a normal job. And it makes me feel like not financially stable, even though in theory, I have more income than when I had a job. But I don't know if you reached a particular level when you felt like, oh, I'm, I'm financially well off. I'm doing well, I still feel like, oh no, I might disappear at any moment. Like, So before I answer that, does that imply that the way that you're trying to solve that problem or you're thinking the solution is that you just wait, you know, you, you set a number and once you get to that number, then then you can disconnect, I suppose, or de-attach, de whatever the term would be, from that uncertainty. So the, the, the volatility is still there, the risk is still there, but once you reach this number, then you, you, you're disconnected from it. You don't care as much. Is that the way that you're thinking that would be the solution? Just to, to clarify your... Well, I guess I'm wondering, is there a number or is it just, is this a personal thing? Like people, are some people comfortable like ages ago? And it's just me <laughs> that's just worried because I do think, yeah. yeah. I probably save more than most people do and yeah, I probably just maybe my whole mentality is I always feel like I'm financially not stable, but maybe relatively I am. <laughs> I have learned that it's a lot about, it's not about how much money you make, nor is it about how much money you keep after making that money, but it's really about how you actually approach money, how you view money and how you spend it. And and then learning, like actually internalizing that rather than just having these beliefs um, about, I don't know, just basically doing things by, by through automatic behavior. We all grow up 
you know, nobody teaches us about money, first of all. So how do we actually learn about what money is and how we should interact with it? What is our relationship with money? That is mostly done unconsciously through imitation of people around us, mostly our parents. Maybe we copy them, we emulate them, with, again, without thinking, because it's never taught, like, this is money, here's your relationship with money, here's how you should think about this. Uh, just like we don't really learn about how to have personal relationships, we definitely don't learn about how to, how to have a healthy relationship with money. And so, yeah, a lot of this just happened through automatic behavior. I think I have a similar automatic behavior to what your, sorry, like the default for me is probably the similar default to yours. And that comes from my parents. I think it comes from your parents as well, um, based on what I know about you. You gotta, you gotta be conscious about that relationship. Like any, it's helpful to think about money as like a person and you have a relationship with it, honestly, because then, yeah, like how do you have a good relationship with people? You gotta be conscious. You gotta put in the work. You gotta think about, you know, like how is this person meeting your needs? Is, it, is money meeting your needs? What are your needs? This whole like long train of thought. Because if you really dig down and go to the source, you'll probably find that a lot of the things that you have fears about aren't valid. They're not justified. I've had to go through that lesson because I've lost a lot of money recently. I made a lot of money and I lost a lot too. And so not only, again, having these ups, but also the downs, it's the downs that force you to learn because the up feels nice. You don't do anything differently. But when you go through a loss or you make a mistake or you feel pain, emotional pain, physical pain, or otherwise, that's really where you have the opportunity to learn. And so I've learned a lot about my own relationship with money in the last, let's say, two years. And I have come to learn that actually I had these original goals from very early on in my Amazon journey or even my financial journey. And those original goals... I changed them as I became more successful, but I didn't change them for any good reason. What happened was I basically went, okay, well, here's this goal. It was, I mean, I made a video about this, which I'm going to publish as well. My original goal was 1 million when I was working as an engineer. Then it was 3 million when I was starting to do successfully on Amazon. And that's just a calculation. That's like, okay, how much money do you need as income to pay for your living expenses? And then how much of a, you know, a principal do you need that from which you can generate that income passively using investments. So 1 million, 40K a year income from 1 million principal, 3 million a year generates whatever 100, 120K per year in passive income. So again, if your living expenses are 40K, then 1 million is enough. If your living expenses are 120K or 100K, then 3 million is enough. And then when I did really successfully on Amazon, I just like blew that number up for some reason. It wasn't that my living expenses did or needed to go up in proportion, but I just somehow decided, oh, because I'm more successful now, therefore I need more money to feel that feeling of security. Uh, and that's when I was gaining a lot. And then when I was losing a lot, I didn't realize. It's like there's this lagging effect of like six to 12 months where your identity is still, you know, what is it? The Wiley Coyote or whatever, the, the cartoon where he like jumps right, off the yeah. cliff and then he's uh -huh. sort of, yeah, roadrunner where he's just like standing. There's no, there's no ground underneath him, but he's still doing oh, this for a little it. while. And then he, and then he falls eventually. There's some lagging and that before you fall, it's very painful. Once you fall and it's okay. So I realized, oh, actually <laughs> that original number was like perfect. That was, that was really good. I'm already way past that original number. So why don't I just take that number and enjoy it? Because again, the things that I spend my money on have changed a bit, but they haven't changed that much. Not in proportion to how much money I was making or, or like my net worth or whatever. So it's half, half for me, the way that I see it is half psychological is understanding what is your relationship with money? How much do you really need for what you want to spend? The other half is reality, which is that you are dealing with numbers that are more uncertain and more volatile. They can go up a lot more. They can go down a lot more as well. And so it depends which piece is really bothering you. So for example, I'm not asking you to do these numbers now, but and for anyone else who's, who's following along, have you done these numbers? Like, do you understand what your actual burn rate is not maybe not present burn rate for example if you want to have kids have a family your 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 living expenses will go up so what's that number going to be more or less and then you can do a pretty it's a really simple calculation to figure out like what number sitting in the bank or rather invested in stocks dividend something that's going to pay you income what does that number need to be and then how close are you to that number or have you already exceeded that number but I don't know, Evelyn, I'll throw it over to you. Like, it, do you feel like it's the psychological thing or do you feel like it's this actual reality of the money and based on your needs? And if so, like, where are you today based on both of those? Well, I haven't, I haven't looked at the numbers, like what actual amount do I need to be able to, you know, live comfortably? I think I just have this default of 
or save as much as I can. Like, <laughs> it's funny when you said, if money was a person. Like, I was just imagining like, this person I'm like clinging to and being like, when I cling to you, I'm going to die. Like, it's, and I want to think. So that's an unconscious behavior. Yeah. Like, and that's a, yeah. But like, I'm like the biggest stinge ever. Like, I, and I don't know why I like that because even between my sisters and me, um, you know, we grew up in the same family, but for some reason, I am like the most, you know, thrift. I don't know if it's because I'm the oldest. So maybe I saw my parents when they had less and, you know, once they needed to save to secure. Yeah, I've always felt like you have to save to secure your future or to make sure that you're going to end up okay in your old age. But I really feel like even if I made millions, I don't even know if I would start spending more. Like, like I just, yeah, it's just such an ingrained habit. Are there things that you want to spend money on that you don't? I mean, I'd really like a house by the beach, but that's very expensive. <laughs> it would still, you know, take a while to have enough to actually get one of those. But that's the only thing. Like, I don't like things like clothes or, I don't know, cars or things like that. Like, yeah. So this this, this t-shirt, which is like a couple of years old, I had to go and dig it out of the wardrobe because otherwise I'd just be wearing a singlet, but I wanted to dress up a little bit for this video so yeah well, I, I think with stuff for free on marketplace it's like one of my like cherished <laughs> joys <laughs> that's like a double-edged sword i i do too as well but i also recognize that i there are other things that i'll get more joy out of and the time it takes to get something for free or cheap it's the time that really costs you but then these things that are really big as in the next step up like the millions of dollars for example that i think it can be a slippery slope where because even though you have potentially infinite leverage with a business, the fact is that it still takes a lot of work to start in, to, to build something that gives you more leverage. And so like that's where, at least for me personally, I had to really start placing limits on what I think is worthwhile chasing. Like how much do I really want to work for an extra million dollars or whatever to buy a bigger house or a bigger apartment or to get like you know a really nice car or something like that. There aren't many other things that you can spend millions of dollars on. You know, it's start, like the, the range of things you can really spend a lot of money on starts to really narrow down. And so it's worthwhile because that pathway is pretty narrow. Like before you go down that pathway and spend three years building your business up to the next level so you can afford it, to just ask yourself like consciously at the start of that pathway, like, fuck, like do I really want to take this next step? Not next step, but the next thousand steps that that will involve. I'm good with where I am. So I know that I don't. I don't want to do things that will compromise my values or will not be particularly enjoyable to try and get to that next level. So for me, the next pathway would be, I don't know, I'd just be upgrading my lifestyle exponentially in every area. And it's not, it's not worth the, it's not worth the hassle to, to be able to spend that kind of money, but it may be for you. I'm not saying that that's not the path that, you know, that you should walk down or that somebody else should walk down, but it's something that I've looked at carefully. Cause again, there's not too many different things. Like if you really want that house, then yeah, you're going to make a million dollars or $2 million. But that's the thing. I realized I don't want to work that much. I don't want to work that much for that house. You know, I want, I'd love a house in Manly, but it's like, it's too much. Like it's not worth the effort to get that. Should you so, so Manly is in, in Sydney. It's a really nice suburb by the beach. It's yeah. Beautiful. It's like, it's got my favorite place to go diving. There's just like so much sea life there. And that's why I want to be at the beach because I am very, I feel very content underwater. <laughs> so I feel like if I could just walk down to the beach every day and go for a dive, that would make me feel content. But not the house, it's not like the actual house on the beach and like the whatever that would represent per se. I just think that life would be contempting. For the audience and for anyone who's watching this, and for you too, Evelyn, and for myself as well. I just really want to stress how important it is to consciously think about these things from different perspectives because the more freedom you obtain and the more financial success you obtain, the more you will have to deal with these issues. And again, if you don't, if you choose not to deal with them, you're choosing not to deal with them. You will just go down in autopilot following the path that you've always been following. And most of that is unconscious behavior. It's learned things. Society has told us or our parents have told us or the people around us have told us. And, and becoming who you are and sort of self-actualization and all these cool things you get to do, particularly when you have this time freedom and financial freedom, 
is you get to actually face down those things one by one and ask myself like is this who i really are who i am like that i don't like renting that could be who you are or it could be something that somebody else has told you and you've internalized that that this other person or my parents or whoever else it is has something against renting and and i don't want to just blindly repeat what somebody else has you know what, what somebody else wants do you have any advice for people who are again back there they're still working a nine to five something like that they're looking at making this change what advice would you give them i think i think they just have to do it you know like you can see other people around you or you know or you see examples of people who have done it and someone else can do it then you definitely can as well and you know like even if you know you have a job so that's an example of something that you show focus and dedication over to achieve something you can just take that and apply it to the entrepreneurial context and if you believe and know that you're going to succeed then you will just take the steps to get there and then you'll be able to do it because i think the reason people don't succeed is because they just don't persevere if success is say success is at ten thousand steps a lot of people they just take five steps and then they just get distracted or say they're too busy and they stop but it's just about keeping going because in theory each little step is not in it in and of itself typical but you just have to take a lot of them and if you do that then i think success is guaranteed has your very very well said very well said particularly uh it was all very well said but um i resonated with the mindset part as well like actually believing that it's possible has so that's how you feel about success now and the advice that you give now has your relationship with what it means to be successful or or like how to become successful has your relationship with that changed between now and and back when you were starting or is this a view that you sort of held even back then and you've made it come to fruition i i'm surprised i think i am surprised at how detached i am to the figures now i i probably would have previously thought the figures in that and more you know like getting bigger and reaching milestone but yeah like i guess yeah that seven figure milestone made me realize like figures don't matter at all to me anymore so yeah i thought that was an interesting point about how i saw success i would say they matter as representations of what really matters which is how much can you actually make your life better doing this Again, are you coming closer to joy and joyous moments or are you going further away from them? And so those milestones are sort of, they're simple ways that we can internalize that actually we are getting closer or we are at that, we're already there. We can already obtain happiness and joy out of life, but that's a, you know, that's a whole separate process. What about other, other people? So you've talked a bit about, you know, how, how other people can achieve success and the specific, whether it's mindset or the specific uh, ways to approach life let's say and, and life's challenges to to reach success what about other people's attitudes towards you and your success because this is something we've talked about a bit off camera beforehand how and maybe maybe there's not much to say here but have you found that now that you are you know you know you're in an envious position where you would have loved to have been you know years ago so you're looking forwards at that everyone everyone of today like has that changed how people see you or how you interact with people at all I think when you're doing well, everyone thinks, oh, wow, you know, like what great figures you've reached. But when you're starting, I was actually surprised at how much negativity you reach. You know, like people are very cynical. Like actually when I first went full time into Amazon selling, my mom, she bumped into a family friend and, you know, they're like talking, oh, what's everyone up to these days? And my mom said, she lied and she said, Oh, Evelyn's working in the city. You know, she's still working in the city. And I asked my mom, I was like, what, why is she lie? And she's like, you know, in this Asian mom way, because you're a failure. And I was like, what? I was like, I told her, I'm like, but I make more money than I ever have working, like in an oil job. And she's like, oh, I didn't know that. But like, yeah, like people, yeah, a lot of people presumed failure. And I, I'm not sure why they did that. You know, my theories would be that maybe like the people close to you, the protective of you. So they don't want you taking this uncertain pathway and they don't, unfamiliar to, you know, you know, they like saying, well, Asian parents like saying they should be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, a dentist, but you know, this 
different path and it's strange and unknown. And even other people, other people who they're successful in their own careers, they would say things to me like, oh, people who tell you that they're making money off Amazon, they're lying. You know, like, it, yeah, there's, there was a lot of negativity, I feel. So, yeah, it, it's di- it's different. Like, your journey as you become unsuccessful. When you're successful, everyone's like, oh, wow. But I think on a little bit, your journey to that point, there's a lot more sooner you go. And, like, surprisingly, so I found. Have you found any? I think this is a really interesting point, and, and your answer is really interesting, and it aligns with more, more or less what I've experienced in my own personal journey. Has it changed any of your personal relationships, for better or for worse? You, you have that example of your mother, but like ultimately, yeah, have you had specific examples where with people you knew more, like let's say closely, has anything changed, better or worse? No, I don't think so. I mean, the thing is, you don't really change. Like, you're the same person, you know? Like, so the people you know before, you're still going to, like, peep on them and make fun of them. You just still have the same dynamic. Oh, potentially, maybe I don't talk about it a lot. Like, because you don't... It feels weird. Like, you don't want to be so much bigger than other people. You know, you don't want to have more revenue than other people and tell them about it. Because it... It feels like, and that's even a reason why I think. Unless you're selling a course, in which case you need to do that, <laughs> and you definitely do want to do that. But I think but that might selling, be a reason. Neither why of us are selling courses, so that's okay. It might be a reason why I don't want to grow. I don't feel the need to grow anymore because I feel a bit like, why do I need to be so much bigger than, you know, the people around me? You know, like why? Why do I need more than other people? So you know, I'm at. A, I feel like I'm at a comfortable level. And I think part of the reason I feel that is because I'm like, well, other people are on this level. So if I'm around there or high, a bit higher, that's not, you know, why do I have to be multiple higher than other people? Has that been, or is that a current temptation for you, which is the feeling to be measuring up or just the act of being measured up or measuring yourself up against people around you? Is that something that you have previously thought about a lot and, and still do today? I think that was my goal. Like, I just wanted to reach a level where I would be making as much as other people, I guess I started, you know, say at the big four with, or at the law firm with, you know, like, it felt good to me to feel like, oh, I made it to that level as well, but in my own pathway. And I don't have to work (laughs) on weekends and doing the night every day. Yeah, so that felt that felt like, oh, you know, look, I did it, but my own way. Nice. I feel similarly. I think at the start, I would say that it was much more driven by just pure ego and definitely a desire to to be seen as being successful. I think that this is a very common thread, particularly the more people are on social media talking about their success, which I am and was. I was a lot more than I am, but I was for sure. I think as a common thread in my experience, the more that somebody trends towards wanting to do that, the more that they're actually filling some sort of hole. And and so it's not a desirable thing. You, the fact that you're out there, you feel this compulsion to get out there uh, to, to, yes, like teach other people and, and help them along the pathway. But I think it's just inherent. It's going to attract a lot more people who are basically, there was a phrase about this, I've forgotten it now, but basically... You, the more external you have to be about it versus simply being satisfied internally, the more externalized it is, the more it represents some lack that you have. And I'm speaking for myself, but I've, I think I've also seen that outside in others as well. But absolutely for myself, 100% true. And it's taken a lot of work to actually fill that hole. Sorry, I mean, it's it's a ongoing prog- progress process rather. So what's next, Evelyn? Let's move on to the future, the final part of this interview. You talked a little bit about your goals, but really what's coming next? First of all, Amazon, what are you doing this for now? Like what's the next step? Amazon and then life since they're connected. I mean, I, I do feel comfortable at the size I am currently, uh, but I think to stay the same size, you need to keep launching new products because, you know, niches shrink and your profits will shrink. So I haven't decided yet whether, because currently I'm just launching similar products so i'll research on etsy 
what other designs might be good to do. I haven't decided whether I want to stick to that approach or do take on new product type. Um, I launched in Australia at the beginning of this year, but it's so tiring. Like it's probably about half a percent of my total revenue. So I feel like it's like a complete waste of time. Like not even worth the effort of sending an email to send stuff to like to, to label it differently to go to Australia. Like it's, I, I honestly have about one sale a day in Australia. Like I'm not even joking. Why? <laughs> So yeah, size wise, I'd like probably just to stay similar size to what I am now, but I do, I need to have a think about motivation. Like do, I, I don't think I want to get bigger just for the sake of getting bigger. So I need to figure out, do I have other reasons that make it worthwhile for me to put in more work and take on more risk? Because I, I am, I'm not a spender, so my expenses are very small really other than my desire for a house but i think that's too big so i'll just come up with some other alternative to that um likewise yeah i think for me my next steps would be a family because i think that would be it would be nice to have a kid but that's a work in progress <laughs> do you think as a as a last question slash comment do you think that coming down this pathway has that how has that changed your ability to have the family or to have family under the conditions and terms that you, that you want? I think it's an amazing opportunity. Like um, I was talking to a girl that went to my school who's been doing Amazon for more than a decade now. And she, her and her husband both Amazon together and they raised their two little girls, you know, like, and I thought that was amazing because who else gets to do that? Like no one does. Like everyone leaves their kids in like childcare or, you know, but they both got to be around for their girls to grow up. Yeah. And I think that's really, that would be really awesome. I agree. I, I don't have kids yet, but <laughs> it, just the freedom and why are you giggling? You I, I, I don't think I have kids. I'm like those claps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my little, my little green kids. Yeah. It seems like a real struggle for most people. And that's again, a function of where we are at in in our journeys and just like being really appreciative of this it's very easy to forget that we've we've both of us and and hopefully people watching as well um are somewhere along this journey where you have actually built some of that freedom up for yourself and sometimes you can forget you know what it's all for and that's why i i i want to focus on this which is you know why are you doing these things what's the actual purpose and and really like how are you spending your time because i think most of us sometimes we I know I can lose sight of the things that are most important to me and then replace those things that are actually really important to me, whether it's having kids, having a family and raising them in the way that you want to with, with freedom and the ability to control your own time and hours, whatever that thing is, that important thing, it's very easy to subsume that pathway as in following the pathway to get the thing that you really want with working more, scaling the business, you know, making more money and just effectively spending your very precious finite time on something that is not that inherently enjoyable. It can be enjoyable, but like, I don't know, if you wanna have family, like I'm sure that that's just a much higher priority. So it's something that's important to me. And I, I think that's a really nice uh, way to close here. Maybe one last thing, if you have any advice, any last advice or anything that you haven't mentioned, uh, touched on yet for let's say the Evelyn who is still back then, she hasn't started yet. And, and knowing what you know today, after going through this whole journey to, work, to get to where you are. Is there anything else you'd say to that, Evelyn? I think that one trait that I've noticed in people who are doing well is they take a lot of self-responsibility. You know, like when there's a problem or a challenge, they're always thinking, how do I solve it? How do I make it better? How do I optimize it? Well, an opposite approach to that, which I kind of see as like a loser mindset is, you know, they're always like, oh, a recession's coming. Oh, 99% people will fail. Like they're always thinking of the negatives and then they use it as an excuse to not even try, you know, but the only, like, if you don't even try that, you're guaranteed to fail. So I think that if you have that mindset of always taking your self responsibility and thinking, what can you change rather than always externalizing blame and playing the victim, then that mentality 
will set you on the right path to succeed. And the other thing is, don't stress. Because I think if you, when you take the entrepreneurial path, especially when you start, every time something goes wrong, it's like, oh my God, it's the end of the world, everything's crashing down. But you realize you can solve anything or even if you can't, you'll still be okay if you don't solve it. Like, it'll be okay. So just try and stay as calm as you can. <laughs> awesome. So let's call it victim mentality rather than loser loser mentality. <laughs> try to try to cultivate a, a yeah like a, a growth mindset right of like having taking control of things and, and and appreciating these things as challenges but things that you can get over rather than just like oh the world is against me it's it's just not fruitful and don't stress super super valuable words uh, everyone thank you so much for coming on today it's been a very insightful conversation for myself I've, I feel like I've learned a lot in these last hours I hope that the people who are watching have taken something out of it as well it's always a pleasure when we talk about these things um, we went deep today. So thanks very much. Thanks, Alice. Bye. That's it. Thanks for watching. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. I would love to know if there was one particular lesson or takeaway that stood out to you, then please leave me a comment down below. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.